everyone. Thanks for coming. I'm Courtney Simmons with DC Entertainment, and welcome to the final panel of the afternoon, The Aftermath, Battle, and Trauma in Comics, a candid conversation about PTSD, depression, the lasting effects of battlefield trauma, and the portrayal of these incredibly relevant topics in mainstream comics. These themes feature heavily in former CIA counterintelligence officer turned Batman writer, uh, Tom King, and his artist partner, Mitch Garrett's current take on Jack Kirby's Mr. Miracle. If you love comics and you're not reading Mr. Miracle, we really encourage you to visit your local comic shop and ask them to please save an issue for you every month because they sell out and they're going fast. In addition to Tom and Mitch, we're going to have a great panel of thought leaders for this important topic, including the 19th Surgeon General of the United States, Dr. Vivek Morthy. That's right. And DC All Access host, Jason Inman, who is a vet himself. And Jason has spent countless hours collecting comics and sending them to soldiers overseas. In addition, they will be joined by J.W. Cortez, who plays Detective Carlos Alvarez in Gotham on Fox, and also a vet. The world is a little bit different in Los Angeles. Hollywood, TV studios, and celebrities make for a culture built around entertainment and creative expression. Intrinsic to our existence as humans is our quest to create meaning, and art allows that process to take place. Enter Michael Falk, digital production artist for DC Entertainment. You know, DC Comics, Superman, Wonder Woman, Batman. Well, that's where this Navy vet works now. he got there is a tale of war, PTSD, and one seemingly insignificant past time that ultimately turned his life around and landed him a dream job. War is an impactful, life-changing event, and it is a challenge to have to turn around and readjust to civilian life after functioning under the constant life threat he experienced during deployment. A recent study performed by an independent research group found that one in five veterans deployed to Iraq or Afghanistan suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder, or as it's more commonly known, PTSD. Michael's readjustment was difficult. So um, I started having some trouble with uh, dealing with certain types of stress dealing with large groups of people where you're constantly on alert no matter where you are and even your own home stops becoming your safe place. While taking a toll on himself, the symptoms were taking a toll on his family. He freaked out and I didn't realize it and the next day he was holding my son and uh, he called me into the kitchen and he, he put a glass in my face and said, do you see this? This is dirty. And, and the rage was just a lot. PTSD was making it difficult to function in his daily life. At this point, Michael made a choice. A choice that brought him all the way back to when he was a young kid. Um, I was always artistic as a child, going back as far as I can remember, back into kindergarten. I was always the guy in class, the kid in class, that, that doodled in the margin of the test. 
I decided that I needed to find an outlet uh, to, to start to deal with some of that stress. And I, I went back to the artwork that I left as a child a few years after that deployment, and it helped. And when I realized that it started helping, I, I thought that that might be something that I end up doing in the long term to help keep myself sane and functioning in society. And, and it started with creating a comic strip uh, based on our interactions with our son, who was six or seven. And I would draw these comic strips, and then I, I realized that they were kind of funny. I was laughing at them, and I was enjoying them. So I put them on the internet. Fast forward years later, he's leading a team of designers using his trial and adversity channeled into a healthy hobby which turned into a profession at DC Comics, the home of legendary heroes. Michael's time in the armed forces produced an individual whose code of ethics and duty complement his higher calling as a leader. Undoubtedly, he would stand out amongst his peers as someone who is reliable and sincerely committed to the cause. He's kind of like the alpha dog. So yeah, he's definitely a great leader and I feel like his military background has helped with that a lot. Being a natural born leader is something that all heroes, super or military, have in common. Comics, in DC comics in particular, has had a long history. There's a lot of interplay between the two. Um, clear back to World War II, characters like Superman, Wonder Woman. Um, it's created a long history and a social commentary of both good and bad um, of that interplay between, you know, military and superhero comics. Whether it's pen to paper or stylus to screen, Michael continues to pull on the lessons he learned while he served in the United States Navy. So it was only fitting that the two of us capped off this experience with pencils in hand, creating something together. A comic cover melding his two worlds, military and civilian, through our eyes. Hello everyone, I'm Melissa Bryan again, I'm the Director for uh, Political and Intergovernmental Affairs at Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America, or IAVA. I'm an Iraq War veteran myself, and for 14 years IAVA has been at the tip of the spear fighting for vets like myself who have struggled with PTSD and other mental health issues, and so I'm really excited about this panel today. I'm going to introduce our panelists again as they come out on the stage, J.W. Cortez. Dr. Vivek Murphy. Tom King. Mitch Garretts. And Jason Inman. So again, really excited to have this really talented panel full of actors, veterans, a former Surgeon General. Ah, I'm geeking out. So <laughs> <laughs> bear with me as I maintain my composure. Um, you know, Tom King, former CIA counterintel officer, and Not uh, you know, I'm sorry. Just just regular intel. Just regular intel. Sorry. <laughs> I like the guys who tell on the cops. You know, you don't want to be counter intel. Right? I work at Defense Intelligence Agency. I totally get it. So, <laughs> so I understand. Um, but I really wanted to start with you, with Mr. Miracle, and talking about this really rich tale that you wrote and, and Mitch illustrated. I read the first few uh, 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 a series of it and 
really the images of PTSD and you know Scott's struggle just leapt off the page. And so I want to start with you and talking about what was your inspiration for that, and then maybe Mitch, if you could you know also come in with how that illustration matched Tom's words. Sure. Um, Mr. Miracle is a deep cut nerd thing, so I'll apologize and give a little introduction of what it is. He's a character created by Jack Kirby, sort of the founding father of all comics. And basically what he is, he's just sort of a Jesus analogy, but he's like, Jesus, um, if God had given up his only son and given him to the devil to raise, and sort of said good luck. And so that, that's his history. He's the son of God raised by the devil. And because he was raised by the devil, from the, he was sort of tortured from the time he was, I mean, tortured both psychologically in the fact that his father gave him <clears> up, <throat> and tortured physically in the fact that he was sort of raised in a torture pit and classic sort of comic thing, which um, is just an, an ideal, which what Jack Kirby does is he creates um, child's visions, which happen to be ideal metaphors for real life. And uh, the idea of someone who feels abandoned and then has a torturous childhood is just an easy metaphor for someone who has to deal with trauma in their life and how they sort of um, translate that into um, getting through the day. So we, we sort of started there with a the guy who, he's a performer, he's always got a smile on his face, he's always sort of taking that trauma, he's a good guy, he's always fighting, but of course underneath is still that sort of that, ch that churn from being given up by your father and being um, raised in a place you don't want to be raised. And that's sort of the founding document, is how do, you, how do you deal with that? How do you keep moving forward in life, even though everything's going wrong? Thanks for that. Tom and Mitch, how did you take those words and take that thought and story and translate that onto the page in your illustration? Yeah, I think something that we try to do different with our Mr. Miracle is that uh, we, we took the trauma of Scott and how, how he's dealing with these things, but we're, it's not like a treatise on PTSD. We're actually going through it with Scott as we go. And uh, it's, it's been really interesting to kind of find Scott's voice in the illustration and portray it in a manner that, you know, the best part is getting these responses on Twitter and et cetera, like where people just recognize themselves in the character. And I think that's, that's been our biggest goal and kind of what we've been trying to do with the book. Yeah, and, and it comes from, I mean, just, it comes from a personal experience, which I don't know if it's PTSD related, but that's the thing with PTSD, you don't know what it is and what it's not in your life. Um, I, was, I, I was just on top of the world, I was, I was writing really well, and everything was going really well, kids were happy and healthy, and wife was doing wonderful. And I had one of those, like, classic panic attacks, like the first season of Sopranos kind of things, where you think you're going to die, but you don't. <laughs> and it feels very dramatic, it feels like the world is going to end, and you wake up and your doctor tells you you're just an idiot. Um, or, I mean, he says it nicer than that. I listen to something you wrote, but uh, but that's the way you translate it. And um, but when I woke up, so this was April 2015. It, it just seemed to me that the world was a little off. Like just things were happening um, in society that I just didn't understand. I sort of didn't recognize, um, like all the rules that I'd sort of been raised to think was the way the world works. Every day I was waking up and looking at the news and realizing the world wasn't working that way anymore. And um, and I and I didn't know whether that was me or whether that was the world. And, and that's a little bit what Mr. Miracle is about. It's about a guy who's sort of, in the first page, he goes through a traumatic experience like that, and he wakes up, and he can't understand the world around him, and he doesn't know if it's his own trauma that's doing it or whether the actual world is, is responsible. And Dr. Morthy, to kind of dovetail on that point, how well do you think entertainment portrays PTSD, whether in comics or, or in other forms, such as, you know, on, on Gotham? How do you think uh, not only the accuracy, but how much can it be helpful for those who are struggling with PTSD in your experience? Well, that's such a great question. And I must say that when I was invited to be a part of this uh, panel, I thought it was one of the most unusual requests that I had gotten. <laughs> uh, and far more interesting than most of the other talks that I end up uh, being a part of. Uh, but I, the reason I was so fascinated uh, to, to join this was because I do think that there's a really powerful role uh, that comics, that other forms of entertainment and media can play in helping to inform people about mental health concerns and, and conditions like PTSD. I think right now, if you look at what's out there, you see that PTSD is sometimes referenced here and there, but it's, it's almost danced around. Uh, people don't often de delve deeply into it. They know it's a sensitive subject, but they're not always sure how to go about handling it. Uh, but the truth is that <clears throat> If you think about PTSD, most people think about PTSD resulting from combat situations that, uh, that are, the members of our armed forces may be a part of. 
Uh, and that is certainly one of the most concerning uh, sources of PTSD. But even for folks who are not in combat, and even for people who don't serve in the military, they go through traumatic experiences that can, in fact, lead to PTSD, which is why somewhere between 7 to 8 percent of the U.S. population will experience PTSD at some point in their life. That's millions and millions of people. It's an extraordinary number. Uh, so I think it is important for us to talk about this experience, to learn about this experience, given how common it is, because whether you are affected directly uh, or, or not, the people around you are likely affected, and how you respond to them, uh, your understanding of PTSD can have a profound impact on their path and on their recovery. Absolutely, and uh, GW, in terms of uh, your military experience, what do you bring that to the table um, in your acting, in your portrayal of your character in Gotham, and in any other uh, venues in which you are conveying your experiences from the military and channeling that experience? I think it's, uh, it serves uh, as such a unique opportunity to have worn the, the uniform of a uh, United States Marine for nearly 13 years of my life and to serve actively as a ura. <laughs> And to still be serving as a, as a real New York cop, um, when I get to play, pretend uh, in these various roles, anytime you can draw on any sort of experience to, to help inform your character's choices, that's a blessing. That doesn't always happen. Yeah. Um, but I feel a tremendous responsibility because I know that my fellow brothers and sisters and their family members are watching. And they may draw some sort of inspiration or simply uh, find a means to get through the, their day. And so the words, I feel, are now my ammunition to, 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 to empower, to hopefully uh, knock down some of these common misconceptions that veterans, we come home and all we want to do is, is you know, slay bodies and, and do drugs and all that. <laughs> you can actually come back and work on a hit TV series like Gotham. <laughs> right on, right on. <laughs> No, I definitely feel your, uh, your your same sentiment, especially wanting to get it right in moments like this. That's right. Uh, <laughs> to include. Um, Jason, in your work as a journalist and your work in moderating panels like this, I know you've been doing this for some time as a fellow Iraq War vet. Share more about your experience and what you've seen in the portrayal of PTSD in comics and other places in entertainment, please. Well, first off, as a fellow moderator, I just want to say you're doing an excellent job. Oh, thank you. I would grade this panel at an A plus right now, <laughs> so keep it up. Uh, that's such an interesting question, especially since my job really deals with uh, talking to gentlemen like this about fictional superheroes that wear tights. Um, but I really think that the military aspect that has really come into uh, my career uh, from my time in the U.S. Army was basically it's taken how I trained in the US Army and just has applied it to every aspect of my life, basically. Simply that, you know, I'm never late to a shoot. Um, I make sure I know everybody on my team, like all the crew, because, you know, they are a team. Um, so that's really, and it has led me to a place where I don't want to waste time anymore, because um, I know from my year over in Iraq, I was there for all of 2005. Um, I feel like every year that's past 2005 now is sort of a gift, and it was a real gamble that I actually have gotten anything past that year. So to me, I'm kind of like, all right, well, this is, you, you originally didn't have this time. Like before that year, I was like, I, after 2005, it's done. That's it, you know, no more. Uh, but now every year that I get past that has been like, all right, you can't waste this year, because this was a year that was given to you that as far as you knew, pre-2005, I didn't have. Right on. Yeah, I can definitely relate to that. And Tom, to get back to Mr. Miracle and the heart of the story, one of the things that I love is the relationship between Scott and Big Barda and their shared traumatic experience and how they kind of get through it, even through the banal talk of couples in the middle of a fight sequence. Um, I found that to be a really clever uh, device in, in showing how it's not all about as JW said, the broken vet. It's not always about, you know, we come home and, and, and we're wrecked. And so how do you try to portray the goodness of after the battle within your comics? Uh, yeah, I mean, um, I think that's, I, when, when we get together, we, all, we joke like PTSD, like you think in your head and you're like thinking of a fan spinning and then you're in a helicopter and you're trying to stab your wife. Like, you just think there's these stupid cliche images that are all over pop culture, but that's like, that's not, not what it's about. Um, first of all, PTSD, at least for me, and I can't speak for everyone, but 
it's such, it's such a more complicated thing than that because it's not just guilt about what you did, it's guilt about what you didn't do. And, and then there's, that's one level of it, like, oh, I didn't do enough or I should have done more or the, what I did was wrong. And then there's this other level with like, there's something enjoyable about war because mm -hmm. um, you feel important, you feel like you're on that tip of the spear, you feel like you're, you, you, you can push the, the world and it moves a little bit. And when you come back to our reality, you, you, you push on the world as much as you can, you can't do anything with it. Um, and, and so then you feel like you want to be back in it, and then you feel guilty for wanting to be back in it, knowing what you did, and then sort of a cycle that becomes, so it's so much more complicated than, oh, I hate myself for what I did. It's, it's more like I, I hate myself and I love myself, and I hate myself for loving myself, and it becomes sort of a, a pattern that gets stuck in your head. Um, and so we put that in a, in a comic book about superheroes punching each other. <laughs> uh, uh, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I think what, what eventually all that becomes is, is that, I mean, if, if, you, if you're old and you live long enough, what you realize is sort of those traumas, those, ho those horrible things that happen to you in life become sort of part of you. Like, you don't be, every, every, you, know, you, you think on paper I should be ashamed of them, but you start to become proud of them. You're like, oh, I went through something, and it becomes, it becomes something you, you take strength of instead of weakness. And I think that's what we try to do in Mr. Miracle. It's, it's about two people who, because of what they've done, they found each other, and they found a romance with each other. Mitch and I are... are lucky enough to be sort of madly in love with our wives. It's something we have luck, good in common. And so, uh, and my wife, you know, she's the one who got me through all that uh, BS. Uh, so we, I just, I try to put that in the comic because that's, I mean, that, that's what it's all about. It's like getting to the next day and my wife gets me there. And that really does come across the page. Mitch, you look like you want to jump in there. Yeah, I, I think one of the, the things about PTSD is that people dance around it, like you said, they don't want to talk about it. But uh, like anything, uh, for example, uh, I just had a child, and something would go wrong with him, or you know, something, whatever, and I would instantly go on Google and type in what happened, and you <laughs> see this whole list of moms and dads who had the same thing. You instantly feel better. And so with Mr. Miracle, I, want, I, I love the fact that readers can see not an answer to it, because there's no answer, but they can see it happening to this, you know, it's a fictional character, but you get wrapped up in it. And uh, <laughs> I want people to see it happening and understand that, oh, I'm not alone. And we're talking about it, it's open, it's out there, it's a book anyone can go buy. And uh, I think that's super important for people to be able to recognize that you're not the only one. Yeah. And Dr. Morthy, from kind of a clinical standpoint, um, the depiction of, of PTSD in entertainment, um, I, I know it's helpful to start the conversation. Are there maybe some dangers to it? Is there maybe a flip side to discussing PTSD that could be not helpful? Well, I think that, well, I'll kind of get to that. Let me just, you, you said something that made me uh, yeah. think for a moment and I just wanted to react to it. Um, I mean, hearing you describe, <laughs> <laughs> hearing you describe the, this, the stories that you've created, what's really striking to me is that you're telling stories about rich emotions. Some of them are positive, some of them are negative. Um, some of them are difficult to deal with. Others are beautiful, like the, really, you know, the, the role that your, you know, the, your wife played, for example, in your story. And what really struck me and surprised me, actually, when I was in office and when I would talk about public health issues to audiences, was that whenever I would talk about topics related to our emotional health and well-being, I found that people responded in a way that was um, that showed deep interest and to a degree that really shocked me. Because you know, as a society, we don't really talk about emotions that much. We have associations of, that we make with emotions where we associate emotions with weakness. We don't really think of emotions as a source of strength. I mean, think about the prototype of what a strong person is it's in, in society today. It's the kind of person who doesn't show emotions, is able to take anything and, uh, and not you know, show that they're anxious or worried or concerned at all. But that's not real life. That's not how most people live. Uh, and so I think that the power of stories, uh, like you're, what you're telling, the power of entertainment more broadly, is it can start and advance conversations in very different ways than uh, traditional books can or lectures can. I think it can tell stories that change our narrative around emotions. For example, it can help us associate emotions not with weakness, but actually with strength. Uh, and if you actually ask any elite athlete, they will tell you that it's that they're getting, the difference between good and great is not just how much time they spend in the weight room and how much time they're on the treadmill, but it's their ability to manage their emotions, to translate uh, their fears into a passion uh, for doing better, for achieving more, 
And that's actually what helps them lift to the next level. But stories like yours can also help us redefine things like courage. So for example, courage, as I think of it, and as I've been taught uh, by wonderful mentors, is actually not the absence of fear. But courage is the ability to move forward even in the face of fear. And when we recognize that, then we, don't, then we can recognize that if we feel fear, that doesn't mean that we can't be courageous. It doesn't mean that we're not strong. It actually means that we're human because we all feel that fear. So there's a normalization uh, around emotions. I think that has to happen like in our country and really around the world. And I think stories like yours can play such a powerful role in doing that. And when it comes to how PTSD is portrayed, I think it can be very helpful when it's portrayed in a real way uh, with its complexities, with you know, the lack of answers that we sometimes have, uh, with uh, stories of what actually help, which are often people uh, in our lives, people who uh, may not have medical training or a medical degree or nursing background, but who through the power of their love and their compassion and their presence can often heal us in ways that are more profound uh, than any medical professional. And those stories, I think, are, ca are captured uh, in the tales that you're telling. And I think what a powerful vehicle that is for changing how people think, not just about PTSD, but about emotions in general. Absolutely. That's the nicest way you've ever called me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. This is a, a rich description of, of the range of emotions. Wow. Um, and Jason, so given that talking about mental health and emotions uh, itself is considered taboo, or at least it was for a long time, do you think these barriers are coming down? Do you think that we're making progress, or is there still a ways to go? I think they are starting to come down because I think that over the last couple of years, we've talked about PTSD as a society, I feel, more than we have, uh, than I remember being 10 years ago when I just got out. Um, then nobody really talked about it. You didn't see it in media like Mr. Miracle or uh, any movies or anything like that. But it's interesting, like I, I, I don't think even this panel would have happened 10 years ago. But we are in a weird situation, especially in this country now. And I remember this statement that uh, an uncle of mine made when I went over to Iraq. And he said, the year I came back, he said, I don't think I know a single person that doesn't know somebody or is related to somebody that has participated in the war on terror. Mm -hmm. And when you think about it from that viewpoint, it's shocking how widespread it is. And so the idea that this issue is being talked about more and more, I think is just going to happen more and more. And it is interesting, because I'm seeing a lot more media as well where we're seeing PTSD viewed from the perspective of a World War II soldier or something like that, which you know was never thought of back in the day, but it surely have existed. It surely was around. Shell People's, shock. Exactly. They just mm -hmm. call it shell shock and get yeah. over it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, it is sort of this invisible disease. And I really appreciate that stuff like this in this panel and, and work like Mr. Miracle is bringing it more and more to the forefront. Right. Um, at this point, if there are questions from the audience, if you could please start lining up at the mics on the right and the left here, um, and I'll call your questions as you come down. But just to dovetail on your point, Jason, absolutely. Um, you know, I, being a woman uh, veteran, uh, people look at me and they think, wow, for, first of all, you were in the Army, you were downrange, you've done these. And so understanding the, uh, the identity of those who are you know, facing war, number one, and then number two, the invisible wounds of war, as you just mm -hmm. discussed, um, it, it's hard to put a face to that. And so it's really great that we're having these types of conversations that are bringing that to the forefront um, for, for all to be able to speak on this with, uh, with authority, with agency, and, um, and to be able to uh, not be afraid to, to show that range of emotions as Dr. Morthy talked about. Um, so I'll go ahead and start from the left here, the gentleman in the Batman shirt. Uh, <laughs> what's your question for the panel? Um, well, first of all, I'd just like to thank all of you who served and all of you who are seeking to bring awareness to such an important issue. Um, my question is, is actually sort of for Tom in particular. Um, I first... Uh, I first became aware of your writing, um, as probably a few people in here, through the Grayson series um, about Nerd. Dick Grayson. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my favorite issue from that was actually one where he returns to Gotham and um, interacts with the Bat family. And he's kind of struggling to connect with them after he's been undercover for quite some time. And I was wondering, with such an optimistic character 
How did you sort of convey these issues of uh, his trauma and uh, struggle to readjust um, with such an optimistic character? Uh, that's, a great, that's a great question. The, the thing about Dick Grayson, who used to be Robin, now he's Nightwing, um, when I write, I, I have sort of an instinct to make everyone sort of dark and sad and looking out a window into the rain. <laughs> um, like one clown tear. So, uh, <laughs> and uh, I worked with Tim, Tim Seeley on, as a writer on that book, and, he, and I, this is my first book, and he was sort of teaching me how to do it. And you know, I wrote my first thing, and it was all one tear going down the face. And he's like, no, the, the thing about Dick Grayson is that he's the hope of Batman. He's, Batman represents, because uh, what makes Dick Grayson great is, is Batman wasn't really raised by anybody. He lost his parents, and he had Alfred, but he, and so he sort of had to find his own way. And Dick Grayson has the exact same origin, as, as unoriginal as that is. His parents were killed. Um, but he was raised by Batman. He was raised by someone who had already gone through that sort of trauma, and so he doesn't have that dark outlook that, that Batman has. That's the difference between the two characters, is that someone that he had a mentor, he had someone who had been through it. And, 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 and the fact that so Dick Grayson is not the character that goes and looks out the window and cries because he, because he has dealt with that pain in a way that Bruce Wayne never can and never will. And, and, and so that, that's the center of that character, is, is he turns... Um, he, he, he's actually a mature, emotional character who's, who's dealt with some of that pain and can, can turn that into laughter and can, can turn that into lightness. So I always, that character is meant to be fun. Like, you, like the world is hard enough when you read Dick Grace and have some fun with it. And, and, and that was the whole lesson of that series. Thank you. Awesome. Yes, go ahead. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank everybody for putting this panel together because PTSD or invisible illnesses as a whole don't really get depicted or focused on a lot in just real life or fictional works. Um, I'm also an Army vet, who cool, Jason. Cool. And thank you for your service. <laughs> thank you for your service. And although I do see a lot of fiction that includes PTSD and I do appreciate the exposure, and uh, it bringing about the conversation and putting it in the forefront of people's minds, there is a bit of a concern, I think you all already touched upon it, about one particular narrative being repeated. And I see that as the broken vet narrative. So I'm sure we have a lot of content creators, future creators here. For all the panelists, how would you, or what advice would you give to them to get away from that narrative, not just with PTSD, but when writing a character that's dealing with trauma? Can I say something real quick? I just shot a, a, an episode for a series on NBC called The Night Shift, mm -hmm. where 70% um, of the cast were all veterans. The director was a veteran, and the writer was a veteran. I think that was a step, a huge step in the right direction. Nothing irks me more than when I see a show where I'll see an officer with stripes and, and <laughs> uh, you know, just looking all jacked up, right? That makes my skin crawl. I, I actually I have convulsions. Um, so, aesthetically, it's important, but to your point, meeting veterans, visiting with veterans, living with us, hiring us, is a step in the right direction. Emphasis on hiring us. <laughs> and, if, and if you're a veteran and, and you're trying to figure out your way into this, into this world of, of, of content, creating, um, you don't have to be in front of the camera like me, you can very well find a really good job behind the character telling our stories. Absolutely. Hey, the gentleman here on my left. Hi. Um, so my question is actually for, for Tom again. Sweet. <laughs> I'm killing so, um, it. <laughs> so I, I never served in any of the wars. So I don't, so I, I, I guess. Slacker. What's the problem? <laughs> well, you know, it happens. Um, but, you can still so, but, sign up. <laughs> it's still going on, guys. Remember those who are still well, downrange. So, so, we're but, almost solved it. We're like this close. <laughs> so, so, but um, I do actually, I did, have, um, I did have some issues with depression, and I think that's something that I, I was going to talk about. So, Tom, you also write Batman, right? Yeah. And so Batman and Mr. Miracle are both guys who have depression, right? Yeah. And, and I, <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I wonder how, I mean, how how PTSD, like writing about PTSD compares to writing about depression and how different they are and, and you know, that kind of thing. Uh, I mean, I, I think what, um, do I call you general? What is it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, the, what the Surgeon General is saying here is, is right, is, is that, um, to, to me, PTSD is, is, a, is about trauma. It's not about war. 
um, on some level. And a lot of people have, a lot more people have experienced trauma than have experienced war. And um, so, I mean, uh, they're connected, right? I mean, you, you, do, you don't have to have um, been in a desert to have seen a violent act, you know? Uh, and um, so, so I, I think we can all draw on that. We can all relate to that. We, we've sort of, I mean, everyone's been through some bad stuff. Um, and, and, um, and, and everyone's gotten over it. It's sort of a universal experience. And, you know, co comics do two things, right? They distract you and they relate to you. And uh, I, I see Batman and Mr. Miracle as being the, the, those two things. Batman's there to distract you. That's like, you know, you, you read the news all day and you're kind of sick of all that stuff, so you want 15 minutes off. So you read Batman and you get distracted from Mr. Miracle. That's, that's to say, okay, you read the news all day and you want to relate to something about that. that that's what you read Mr. Miracle for, but it, it's all related to each other. That's a crappy answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we'll go over here to the, my right. Thank you. Uh, just real quick, just uh, specifically for, for Mitch, uh, I mean, we, Jason talked about you know, being a silent disease. <laughs> I, I know it doesn't surprise you. My next one was the, uh, <laughs> but no, Jay's talked about it being a silent disease, and uh, Mitch specifically, you like not having not having served, but a lot of your work that I've seen with the activity, <laughs> Punisher, Sheriff, and it, and now in, even Mr. Miracle, you're drawing soldiers and dealing with their 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 issues and everything. And so I was just curious. I I I know you do like for to get the poses down and everything. Sometimes you take photos of yourself, and we absolutely believe that's 100% artistic value. And don't don't even worry about it. But what I want to know is to to get those subtle expressions instead of going big and bombastic with the emotions, it being the silent and an, and an invisible disease. There's so much subtlety in the expressions, and everything conveying that pain and that worry and that trying to be strong in the face of fear. I was wondering how how are you able to get to that to that point uh, or get yourself in that mindset to, to accurately portray that. Yeah, I think the way I approach comics is different than I think the way most people approach comics in that I'm not setting out to make a comic book, I'm setting out to tell a story. And at the heart of every story isn't the trope, it's not the plot, it's not, it's people. And uh, I know people because I am one. <laughs> <laughs> and so, it's yeah, <laughs> questionable. Uh, but like, I, I would rather get into the headspace uh, to figure out these characters. Because like, when, you're, when you're talking with friends and stuff, uh, think about that camera moving around. Like in a comic book, it's, most people draw a camera everywhere. Like it's jumping around, big action stuff. But when you're just like sitting around talking to your friends, or even in an action situation, that, that real life camera is kind of staying still. For nine long panels. Yeah, for nine long panels. <laughs> and, uh, but like, there's so much, there's so much on a person's face that conveys everything. Uh, I mean, my goal, just to screw with this guy, is to make a book completely readable without reading any of the words, because they're terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. I'm aware. But uh, so it, it's all just about getting into the headspace of people. Uh, even the military thing. Um, it's a topic I was, I've been very into. I have a lot of friends, family uh, who have served. And uh, even the, the superficial part of that, it's a topic I just had a lot of interest in, uh, fictional and otherwise. And so as I was doing things like the activity or Punisher or Sheriff, uh, I, I, one of the things I found so cool is how these people are trained. They're trained, they move differently, they're taught how to move. And so I went and took classes with, uh, there's a Navy SEAL, uh, company back in Minnesota where I was originally from and uh, I went there and they trained me on how to move and how to hold a firearm etc because I wanted to bring that into the book because I know from enough of my vet friends that the number one thing that will take you out of any entertainment is having your scope backwards is a guy holding a gun weird is <laughs> because you're trained that you will never do those things so if they see it they're out yeah. and so my goal is to keep them in Cheers, well, you Thanks. definitely suspend that disbelief in your images. Um, I think we have time for one, maybe two more questions before I start getting the wrap it up box. So uh, let's go over to you here on the left, please. 
Hi, I know you guys are probably weird looking at me because I'm way too young, but um, <laughs> hi, um, my name's Stefan, and as I was on my way here reading my misnumbered Batman, number, which said, my misnumbered Batman number nine and uh, Mr. Miracle number three, by the way, love both of these, um, <laughs> I was yeah. thinking about how you write these two very traumatized characters, Scott Free and Miss and Bruce Wayne, which seems like Scott Free is like now gunning for DC's like face of trauma and this Next question is just for all of you guys, whether you have read it or not. Actually, this one mostly, for, actually, uh, Tom and Mitch. <laughs> so sorry. Um, I'm trying not to faint. Um, <laughs> so, we love you, awesome nerds. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> so since you since you write these two characters and their trauma in two very different ways, like with Scott Free, you very do write it in almost a humorous type way. At least in my interpretation, I may be wrong. You are the writer. And um, since Batman, you write it in this very brooding, tar dark type of way where it seems like he's more, or it seems like his flaws are more uh, outlined too. How does it, <clears throat> how are you able to write both of these things so fluidly and so effortlessly and make them so amazing? And with Jason and... The best question ever. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And I'm only Whatever 16. my wife paid you was worth it. And, uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but Thomas started floating above his chair, like, yeah. very high. Yeah. Keep, yes. I'm so in love with you guys. Anyway, um, <laughs> so... I think you should hug him. <laughs> Tom, Mitch, Dude, You're a young you comic book fan. I'm in love with you. <laughs> Thank you. So Tom and Mitch, since you guys are so able to do this, how are you guys able to do this so well and so fluidly? And with Mr. Cortez, Dr. Murthy, you are a doctor, <laughs> um, Mr. <laughs> Cortez, um, how does it, how does seeing this, seeing them do this so effortlessly and so fluidly affect how you guys, <laughs> how you guys take this and affect you guys seeing this? Because I know Jason, you're a huge comic book fan. Speaking of which, I also bought this at a Walmart, like how you always buy yours at Walmart. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you to the stage manager. You rock, kid. I don't know who that's for, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I don't know where I'm Just thank you. That's all I have. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, how, how do I do, do it so well? Uh, <laughs> It's all a bluff, so dude. You don't even know. Uh, it's, well, I'm, I, there's like a generic team answer that everyone would give now, so I'm going to give that one. Uh, it's I'm part of a team, and it's the editor and the artist, and that's like all 100% true. Um, but I, mean, I, I think the real answer is I grew up, I grew up in comics, and, I, and, and when I was a kid, um, uh, comics were what people who sort of didn't fit in, and I, th I, th I think still were a misfit medium. We're, we're four people who don't, um, who, who kind of don't see reality the way everyone else sees it. We're, we're, we're four people who kind of get beat up by the bullies. We're four people um, uh, who can't run as fast as the fastest dude. And, and, and comics somehow give you, I don't know, I, don't, I can't explain why, why dudes in tights in panels give you relief from the pressure of those circumstances, from being the kid in the corner who can't quite fit in, but they do. And I still connect with that, and I, and, I, and, I, and I draw all the energy just from that moment, from that feeling of, of, of that one kid in the classroom who's reading a comic book, and it makes them feel better in a moment of, tr of, of stress. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> you absolutely rock. You bought us five more minutes. And so uh, with that, we're going to take a couple more questions before we wrap it up. Please. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming here and playing the song for us. Um, earlier in the panel, it was, it was briefly talked about how Part of uh, PTSD, especially, PTSD, especially when it comes to conflict, is that there's a certain aspect of conflict and violence that's exciting and enjoyable in its own weird way. So I guess my question would just be then, how do you go about either writing or depicting that aspect of it without one kind of fetishizing like the brutality of it, while also kind of getting the point across that that's a part of it, and there's not, it's not necessarily something that's wrong with you, but it's just something you have to deal with. I know when I was doing uh, Sheriff with Tom, violence was, uh, was really important to me as I was kind of developing how that book was going to look and portray, because 
I didn't want it to feel like an action movie to people. I didn't want it to feel glorified. Uh, and so I'll, I always joke with Tom that I'll send him my psychologist bills. But uh, <laughs> you know, I, I looked at some pictures that I'll never get to unsee, but it was all because I just wanted that book to not, to not portray it in a way that was fetishizing anything, but to show that if these if these events do have to occur, if violence has to occur, there is a consequence, and you know it, it, it changes everyone involved. And I think that was something I really wanted to push on that book, and hopefully I did. But and I'm going to spoil some DC stuff um, that we're doing in the future, but I just want to talk about it. Uh, uh, D D DC is we're a cool. Co it's a cool company. We have cool leaders, and and. And we've talked about these trauma issues before, and they, they came to me and they said, can we do something about this? Can we do something with it to make it, to address exactly what you were talking about? Um, the idea that, that what we do is we draw, I mean, every DC comic is full of violence, that, and it's fun and exciting, and I love reading about, about that, but do we talk about the consequences of that violence, both on the characters and, and, uh, and on the readers? And, and they asked me to, to sort of to think about that and, 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 and do something with it, and we are, we're creating something, um, I'm not supposed to talk. I'll talk about it anyways. Um, it's, called, it's called Sanctuary. We're, we're creating something where, where it's sort of like a crisis center for superheroes. And it's going to be DC-wide, all the superheroes. And it's going to be a place where these superheroes who are living violent lives every single day. Batman gets in a fight every single night, five times a night. There he is crying back there. <laughs> <laughs> he just took down that baby. Uh, <laughs> and so we're, we're creating a space where superheroes can go that, that, that sort of mimics the good work people are doing for veterans around, around the world, where, where they can have a space where they can actually admit that this violence has had consequences for them and has affected them mentally. And so that your greatest here is the people who are inspiring our children can say proudly, yes, I've had some mental difficulties, and yes, um, working with people has gotten me through them. And we don't hide behind that. So we're doing that in the DC. Mm -hmm. Dr. Morrissey, you want to jump in too? Yeah, you know, this is a, that is a fascinating question. <clears throat> and I think if you look at, and I think what they said is exactly right on, which is that when you look at the way violence is portrayed <clears throat> in much of entertainment, it's portrayed in a very one-sided way. You see the significance that people experience when they engage in violence. You see the rush and the excitement that comes from it. You don't see the whole story of violence. You don't see how it impacts people the next day and the day after and the years afterward. And telling that whole story is incredibly important. It turns out, you know, violence is a form of trauma. And, you know, the streets, you know, of many of our cities every day are filled uh, with people who are experiencing violence, either as the perpetrators or as the victims. And that trauma can result in PTSD. And one of the consequences of PTSD we don't talk about very often is the isolation and loneliness that results from it. Uh, for many people who have experienced PTSD, and I have I've been in a position of being so privileged to be able to care for many patients who have uh, sadly experienced PTSD, the anxiety and the depression and the hyperarousal that come with it often lead them to withdraw from other people, including people that they have very strong relationships with. And that loneliness and isolation can have its own consequences in terms of adverse effects on their health. You know, sometimes I find it interesting to know that people who are lonely, in fact, live shorter lives, and the reduction in their lifespan is about equivalent to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. That's how powerful loneliness is in terms of its impact on our health. But PTSD and, and other uh, mental health conditions can actually lead people uh, to more isolation and to more loneliness. This is one of the consequences of violence that we don't often see uh, portrayed. And that's why it was actually very interesting to hear what you were talking about with the sanctuary, because the antidote to loneliness is, in fact, community. It's being able to know that there are people who care for you, being able to talk to and engage and be around people who have shared similar experiences. And I'll say this lastly because for all of you out there who may know somebody who's experienced trauma, who may know somebody who's, uh, who has been diagnosed with PTSD, you might ask yourselves, well, what should I do? What should I do? And it's an appropriate question. And we live in a very action-based society where it's always about what action should I take, what action should I take? But sometimes being is more important than doing. Sometimes being with somebody, witnessing their journey, listening to their story without having to fix all of their problems can be the most powerful thing that you do. So again, you don't have to have gone to medical school or to be a nurse or to be a psychotherapist to be able to contribute and support somebody who's experiencing PTSD. 
but your presence in their life, your ability to share love and to be a witness to their experience in the way that Tom's wife did and the way that so many uh, of you can do, that is where your power is. That is what makes all of you potential healers. We're having such a powerful conversation here that I'm getting the go-ahead to keep on going. So we're going to take two more questions. I'll start with the woman here to my right. Hi. Um, my question is for Tom. How do you... <laughs> I'm leaving. <laughs> I haven't watched Gotham. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Heroes don't cry. On the movie star panel, nobody asks me questions. <laughs> I love your t-shirt, by the way. Thank you. That's, that's a nice one. Yeah, what's up? Um, how do you think Grayson helped Damien? Because I personally think that Damien has gone through some sort of trauma. As yeah. I think we all know, the League of Assassins is not a good place to grow up. <laughs> yeah. As I, obvious. And then Gotham, also not, not good. It's not <laughs> yeah, a good no. place. That's right. Um, that's, a, that, that's fantastic. I, I, I think... The relationship between Damien and Dick. So this is Batman's, I'm, I'm going to translate nerd to non-nerds. <laughs> um, if you're a non-nerd out there, you know, leave. Um, <laughs> Why are you here? <laughs> uh, Damien is Batman's biological son. Dick is kind of his adopted, adopted son. So they're, they're like an older brother, younger brother kind of thing. And um, like I said, Dick, they've all dealt with sort of this, this childhood trauma. And, but ba Batman is, is not the best father ever, um, and it's a shocker, right? Um, Batman is singularly focused. The only, he's, he's sort of made a sacrifice in his life that uh, I'm in a war on crime, and that's, that's sort of an existential goal for him that he puts above everything else. Um, and if, if you are a father, you know that that's sort of not what a a, being a father is about, putting this one thing above everything else, and sort of the, everything goes with that. And I, I think that's what Dick adds to the relationship, is, is, is that Dick is the person who can go for him and, and be like, more important than crime, more important than anything is our relationship and our love. Batman can't say that out loud, but Dick's comfortable enough with his emotions to say that kind of thing. So I think that's the role he plays. He's sort of the warmth in his life, which older brothers often do. Not mine, but some. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. And then last question of the day goes to the gentleman on my left here. Hi, um, this is a question for Tom in Michigan. Sorry. <laughs> You're, you, you look if you ask me about today, Gotham though, TV show, I'll be pissed. That's a lovely red sweater. <laughs> um, so one of the most powerful and striking things in uh, your, your collaborations on Mr. Miracle and uh, Sheriff of Babylon is the black, all black panels with the white text, uh, Bang in Sheriff and uh, Dark Side is in Mr. Miracle. Uh, and one of the coolest things it does is that uh, comics being a silent medium, uh, instead of trying to get like a loud bang, you know, giant monopoly, it isolates it and brings it down. Um, and in Sheriff, it doesn't show the actual violence, it shows the aftermath afterwards, it blocks it out. Uh, what, how did you come up with that and what, what inspired that? Is that such? Man, it's such, a, it's such a banal answer, I should pretend it's really deep. Uh, <laughs> it was the first comic I ever wrote and the first scene had uh, a 12-year-old you know, girl getting shot in the head and, uh, and I just didn't want to show it because I have kids and I just didn't want a picture of a 12-year-old girl getting a bullet going through her. Um, uh, so it, I, I just said, in, instead of writing that description of that horror, I just I wrote black panel words, bang, and then I just showed the aftermath. And, 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 and it started with that and I realized sort of it, it was a powerful use of the medium. I mean, comics are all about um, the contrast between words and pictures and, 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 and how you make tension between those. That's the one thing the medium can do that no other medium can do. And, and so it was sort of a new way to explore that tension. Um, so take the high flute and answer and not just the easier or answer. <laughs> well, the nice thing about the, the bangs and Sheriff and then the dark side is in Mr. Miracle is that it forces the reader to stop. Uh, and actually, I think they, it becomes more impactful than showing that girl get shot in Sheriff because uh, it forces you to stop and it forces you to think about what just happened rather than kind of see it and move on or you know even glorify it as violence in your mind. Uh, and the best part is it's super easy to draw. <laughs> it's just a black pen. It's super easy to write too, yeah. just black pen. There's, there was one whole page of Mr. Miracle that just says Dark Side Is. It took me like two minutes, got paid like 300 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
Awesome. Well, on that note, that's all we have for questions. We're going to do a super quick lightning round and just go down the line with everyone. Uh, I'll start with Jason. Uh, just give me one of your last takeaway thoughts for this audience, for all of those folks watching us on the YouTube channel, on your thoughts on PTSD and, and talking about mental health in this medium. Uh, the general, Surgeon General, sir. Uh, <laughs> He said the thing about loneliness, which I thought really hit me, and um, it is about loneliness. Um, I run this program called uh, Comic Drive for Soldiers. I do it every year. I try to send as many comic books overseas um, to soldiers over there. And it's, uh, thank you. Um, and DC Comics graciously donates every single year, and they keep up. And this year, they donated 10,000 comic books. But I do that because I want to give the troops something to show them that they're not forgotten, because that is a big thing, especially um, um, when you're overseas, you can feel like you're forgotten anytime you're on tour, and that is a big deal. I think letting the soldiers know in every branch, in every service, wherever they are, that they're not forgotten and that we're with them. Awesome. Mitch, final yeah, thoughts? I, I think on those same lines, uh, I just, it, it means so much to me that, that men like this went out and stood for that, and, and, and you as well, uh, because I got to pursue my dream. I got to, my dream since I was four years old was to draw comic books. And the only reason I got to do that is because of guys like this. Um, yeah, building off what you said about, about loneliness, one thing, the way I fight all this is, is having readers and having interactions and having people come out like this. So I just want to say thank you. I mean, you guys are saving my life and I appreciate it. Thank you so much. I just want to say this has been a real privilege to be a part of this panel. And one of the things I'm taking away from this uh, is that you know the stories uh, that uh, Tom has been writing, the, the stories that can be written through entertainment and media, uh, they can change, they can open us up to the fact that at the end of the day, we're all vulnerable to the impact of trauma. We all have complex emotions that we experience, some positive, some negative. Uh, and the more we can be open about that, the more we can see the whole picture of the human experience and talk about it, I think the more we can experience life authentically, the more we can help each other when we're down as opposed to hiding. Uh, it has broken my heart when I have seen <clears throat> folks who have served in the military and who have experienced PTSD who feel ashamed of their diagnosis and who feel ashamed to talk about it because they feel like they did something wrong or they weren't strong enough to cope. Uh, all of us are susceptible and vulnerable at different points in our life. Uh, and if we recognize that, then I think we can accept each other, we can stop judging each other, and we can be there for each other. And we did not forget about you, JW. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's just a, a unique opportunity that I get to come back from, from serving in the invasion of Iraq and that I get to go home every single day after my tour of duty as a real New York cop, right? Um, I know that at the age of 18, to be forced to fill out a will and power of attorney and then go fight a war is not a normal occurrence. You shouldn't be 18 years old having to figure out what you're gonna leave your loved ones in case you get killed overseas. So it is for them that I continue to strap on my uniform, that I continue to go out there and audition because I know that at some point they will come back with God's grace and will wonder if what I did mattered, um, is there a place for me back in the world? And it's incredibly powerful to look at someone right in their face and say, yes, it was important. And yes, you do have a place. And so I live with that every single day. I think about my buddy Shane Childers who was killed and taken. I think about Chris Kyle who I had the pleasure of doing a television show with. I think about these men and women every single day who receive the phone calls and don't get to come home and, and those kids who have to learn how to deal with that incredible burden. And so it is for them that I continue to go and do what I do because I must, I have to show up. Uh, God gave me that opportunity. And so it's a deep answer, it's a long one, but if you're out there and you're wondering if you deserve another day on this earth, you do. And if you need to talk to me after this, I am more than happy to do so. And if you're watching us from the world of YouTube, then reach out to me. I'd love to hear your story and uh, connect with you. And uh, I'm just so honored that DC and Warner Brothers understands the importance of a panel like this. We are saving lives at this very moment.
Thank you to Warner Brothers and to DC Comics for this wonderful panel. Thank you for allowing me to moderate this great panel. I'm honored to be here on this stage. Give it up for her, man. Yeah. Give it up. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, again, I'm Melissa Bryant from the Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America. You can follow our work, our advocacy, and also our direct services at IAVA.org. Hey, if you are a veteran out there who's struggling or you know someone who is, you can call our Rapid Response Referral Program. You can talk to one of our veteran transition managers who are master's level social workers. We're here to help you. Please, if you're struggling, reach out. That's all we have for today. Thank you guys so much. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, everyone on YouTube. I love you awesome nerds. <laughs>